Okay, the first slide has some important information on it because it's my contact information. If you don't get a chance to talk to me today or you don't sign up for the master class on Friday and you have a question about either the material or anything else that I talk about, there's my email address, connect me with me on LinkedIn, a chance to ask questions. And as most of you know, or you can see because it's pretty obvious, I'm incredibly old. I might not make it through this presentation. <laughs> so I think it's pretty important. This is a book that nobody has time to read. And so if you think the presentation is worthwhile, I'll be happy to send it to you. Not the PDF, but the PowerPoint. These are very boring slides. I don't have any cats running away from cucumbers. It's pretty much text. You could translate it to Danish or whatever. And the slides are yours to share with anyone uh, in your colleagues, your family, whatever. So thinking fast and slow. Is that what you do for a living? Is that thinking? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So I, I take a little survey around the world. What's the longest amount of time you have ever sat staring at a screen without moving, without getting up to either go to the toilet or get another cup of coffee or a slice of pizza? You sat working on a problem of some sort, thinking. That's what you're paid to do, isn't it? Think. So tell me in hours, what's the longest amount of time? Just shout it out. What's the longest amount of time in hours? Eight. Okay, any more than eight? That's a long time. Who said eight? Okay, don't hire this guy. You sat for eight hours? And uh, did you solve the problem? Uh, because we okay, you got it done. All right. So that's the answer I usually get is, yes, I really did sit and stare for eight hours. The record, by the way, is 16. A young lady in Chicago sat for 16 hours. But I also have two gentlemen from the UK who sat for 13 hours. And they all said the same thing. Oh, but I solved the problem. Or we got the report done. We did what we were paid to do. That this is the best way to do that. This is very slow thinking, and it's the way we think thinking operates. This is what we do. Stare, staring at a screen. Or maybe uh, we're also doing something like that. Different kind of setting, but still staring at a screen. Wait a minute, what are you doing right now? What have you been doing for the last three days? In a room with no natural light, sitting, staring. Is there a lot of thinking going on here? A lot of good quality thinking? Uh, I think there are some things in common in those two situations. The idea of staring. We think that's good. Focus, focused attention is good. We're under a lot of pressure, and we know that if others don't see us staring, well, they, they will think we're not working. I've actually known managers who locked people in a room saying, you guys are not coming out until you're finished. And of course, you wouldn't ever stop and take a break because then people would think, oh, they're taking a break, they're not working. And this is what passes for thinking. This is why we get paid the big bucks. 
So how many of you have heard of the book? Okay, keep your hands up. You have heard of the book. How many of you who have heard of the book actually went out and bought the book? Hmm, okay, about half as many bought the book. Okay, those of you who bought the book, how many of you opened to the first chapter? Pretty good. How many of you made it through the first chapter? Hmm, not so many. How many of you actually made it through the whole book? Okay, the same guy, where you were reading the book and you sat for eight hours reading the book. <laughs> yeah. So hence the reason for the talk. This is an important book that nobody is reading. And there's a reason for that. It's dense, it has a lot of evidence in it, a lot of science, a lot of proof for thinking and a better way of thinking about thinking. It's based on the research of two people, even though there's only one author. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky worked together for decades, and they produced a lot of evidence for the flaws, recommendations for better ways of thinking, and ultimately, Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize. Amos Tversky, by that time, had passed on. You can't win a Nobel Prize unless you're alive. So the book is not new. It was published in 2011. But when I do surveys of groups of people like this, I find a lot of people have heard of it. Many people may have bought it. Many may have made it through the first chapter, but they never finished the book. And so, therefore, they can't take advantage of the recommendations based on scientific evidence that would help them improve their thinking. So now I try to do a little summary, and on Friday I have a little class, a full day on better ways of thinking. So I hope that maybe by the end of this session, you might be inspired to either go get the book or maybe finish the book, get past the first chapter. There's so much evidence now. We don't do any science. In our domain, we tell stories in fact, at this conference, most of the talks, the ones that I have heard anyway, are your stories. They're wonderful stories. I would like to hear how you're doing some new thing or using some new tool. That's interesting to me, of course. But I don't hear any scientific evidence. Nobody has any proof. Nothing that would even pass for an hypothesis and a real experiment, a randomized control trial of some sort that would prove that any of this is worthwhile. We don't do it. We don't have the resources. We don't have the inclination, I guess, to do real science. So it behooves us to pay attention to people who do people who do real science so that we can say, well, all right, we don't have the time for that, but we sure want to be better at thinking. So let's look at the evidence. Let's look at suggestions for trying to do a better job of thinking fast and slow. Daniel Kahneman proposed a model for how your brain works. And I'm not really fond of the names that he came up with for these two modules, but they are not his creation. They were in the field for a long time. So we can't blame Kahneman for naming these two pieces of the brain, System 1 and System 2. But now we should all be using them. We should all be talking about these two pieces of the brain. So what's the difference? System one 
Well, you could call that the unconscious. No one likes that name for System 1, but it's most appropriate, especially for those of us who are not cognitive neuroscientists. We have a feeling about what unconscious means. And, of course, that's the fast thinking. We know the unconscious never sleeps. It runs 24-7. It's in charge of all your bodily functions, so it's a good thing that it doesn't need a break or take a nap. That makes sure your heart keeps beating, your blood keeps flowing, all your organs continue to function well because they're under the guise of the work of System 1. System two, on the other hand, well, if we're going to use unconscious for system one, then we have to say conscious mind for system two. Again, the neuroscientists don't like that, but I think we have a sense of what conscious means. It means that's when I'm alert. That's when I'm paying attention. System two, we know, does go to sleep. It comes online when you wake up. And the unfortunate thing about that is when we wake up and when we become conscious, then we associate intentionality and all forms of thinking with the conscious mind, with system two. We are enamored of system two. We think that that's what thinking is, is the use of the conscious mind. There are other differences. System one is where your intuition, your gut feelings live. We all know what that's like to have an irrational sense of something that we should do or a decision that we should make, and we can't explain it necessarily. We just feel it. That's coming from system one, your fast, unconscious system. System two, on the other hand, that's the slow thinking, rational, logical part of our brain, the newer part of our brain. System one can multitask, obviously. It takes charge of every vital organ that you need to survive. That's a lot of work, and it can do it easily. System two, on the other hand, no matter what you believe, no matter what, what your colleagues tell you, cannot multitask. It cannot do more than one thing at a time. Now, as soon as I said that, immediately many of you said, oh no, I can think of examples. I can think of examples when I do more than one thing at a time. For instance, I can walk around up here and also talk to you. Am I not doing two things at the same time? And the answer is not consciously. Unconsciously, I can walk. I don't really have to think about walking. In fact, if something happened to me, if I had a stroke on the stage right now and lost my ability to walk, I would have to consciously learn how to walk again. I say that with some familiarity because I have friends who have gone through that. And it's painful to watch because while they are walking, they cannot do anything else. They must focus their conscious attention on every step they take. They're teaching their brain again how to do something that I can do without thinking that is without conscious attention. So most of the examples you will come up with for multitasking are like that. I'm really doing my walking unconsciously. Think about when you learned how to drive. In the beginning, you had to consciously think about everything you did with your feet, with your hands, with the steering wheel, paying attention to a lot of different things. But now when you get in your car, as soon as you close the door, the next thing you realize you're home. And you didn't really consciously think about any of the elements of driving. 
that activity moved from being conscious to being unconscious. In fact, that's what learning is. Moving from the conscious mind to the unconscious mind. It's nice to know as I get older and I tend to forget things that you have the same problem. Come on, haven't you left your phone in a restaurant or your keys? You put them down somewhere and now you don't know where they are or you can't find something that you were sure you had right in your hand and now you've lost track of it. We all have that. That's conscious remembering, which is seriously flawed. System one, on the other hand, remembers at least your version of everything. Everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever read. The problem is, it's unconscious. We don't have a doorway that we can open up and say, hey, I don't remember where my keys are, can you tell me? Oh, wait a minute. Actually, we do. There is a door. We just need to know where it is and how to how to operate it. Look at the speed comparison. System one is incredibly fast. It can handle an enormous amount of information. System two, on the other hand, very limited. It's not only slow, the logical part of our brains, but it just can't handle a lot of input. We know most of everything we do is done by system one. The problem is, right now anyway, we don't really know how to get a hold of it and how to use it properly. Uh, this is a diagram that cognitive scientists used to say, you know, this is an image that will let you have an understanding of the relative importance and sizes and activity of your brain. It's not real, it's actually a fake iceberg. And we think of an iceberg as having an enormous piece that's under the water that's not visible. And that used to represent your unconscious mind. And then the rest, the small part above the water, well, that was used to say, well, this will give you an idea of how big your conscious mind is. But now... In the last few years, cognitive scientists are saying, wait a minute, do you see that little tiny snowball on top of the peak on the right-hand side of the visible part of the iceberg? Can you see that little snowball? I don't know whether I can pull. Oh, there it is. There it is. Do you see that? That's your conscious mind. And the rest, everything above water, everything below the water, that's your unconscious. In fact, there are some neuroscientists who are saying, we're not even sure why you have a conscious mind. <laughs> it's so ineffectual. It's so limited. It's so slow. And of course, now Kahneman has proof for that. It's so slow. If you look at what system one does, well, it's so fast because it operates with a set of what are called heuristics. They're automatic. It also has a collection of all the memories that you've ever had. And at any time in your life, you will continually look for an explanation of what's going on in front of you. And system one is only happy to provide that. That's one of the jobs, one of the very important jobs of System 1 is to make sense of what's going on in your experience and to explain it to you so that you will feel okay. In fact, most of the time, if it can, it will make you the hero. You are right. You're the one who sees clearly. You're the one who knows the truth about what happened. 
If you go to my country right now, we are severely divided. We got 50% of the people who believe that that idiot in the White House is deserving of the office of President of the United States. And the other half says, what's wrong with you people? Are you crazy? And we cannot have a conversation with each other because our system ones have told us a story about what's right and what's wrong. Who is Donald Trump and who is he not? What's the future of the United States of America? And we don't agree on that either. And we cannot even have a conversation about it. Families don't invite those weird uncles to Thanksgiving dinner anymore. And we take people in our community that we know are on the other side and we unfriend them on Facebook and we don't speak to them at the grocery store. But we are each sure that we are right. System one takes care of that for us. Thank you very much, System One. It's also loaded with a whole collection of cognitive biases. I think the worst are these three. The first one is called the confirmation bias. That once we believe in something, we tend to filter all the information that we run into to make sure that we don't get go of that firm belief in anything. We will do that to the extent that we will ignore evidence if it's presented. So you cannot argue with facts. You'll say, I don't even hear those facts. I think we're mostly technical people in here, and we tend to believe that intelligent argument should be based on logic. It should be based on evidence. When really, system one doesn't care about logic. System one runs on a series of stories that it tells itself. And those are called biases or heuristics that it uses for making decisions. And logic is not in the list. So confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance. It's really uncomfortable for us. If we believe in one thing, we cannot turn around and believe in the opposite idea at the same time. It causes us physical pain. So we're never going to change our minds about something that we care about deeply. It's just too uncomfortable. And then finally, naive realism. The belief that we are rational. And if we could just explain whatever it is to those other people, well, they would surely listen because they're intelligent too, aren't they? And then they would understand our point of view and then agree with us. I have a friend who does negotiations for companies, for countries, and he has said, Linda, you know, it's really easy to get people to come to the table because each side believes that they have an explanation for the current situation. And if they just have a chance to explain it to those other people, and if they will really just listen, then all will be well. They will understand our point of view. It never happens. Naive realism. The result is we walk around with a very flawed system one that is a fast thinking machine but has a set of cognitive biases that prevent it from really operating well and a very slow, deliberate, unable to process a lot of information, system two. And of course, due to the fine work of system one, we believe that we always see reality. We see the truth. We see the world as it is. A quote from Daniel Kahneman, I'm considered one of the worst offenders on many of these errors. I'm overconfident when I preach against that. I make extreme predictions when I preach against that. Some people read Thinking Fast and Slow, hoping it would improve their minds. I wrote it, 
and it didn't improve mine. These are deep and powerful and hard to change. Most people got that message who read the book, got that message. How flawed system one is. How inadequate system two is. But I got something more. So even for those of you who read it, I got this. Yes, system one is flawed. That's right. It's the seat of all those cognitive biases. Yes, it's not a good decision maker. But at the same time, it knows everything I have ever experienced. It knows everything I have ever done, every problem I have ever solved, all the books I've read that I think I don't remember. It's all there. It's all there in system one. If I will just allow myself the chance to use it. And that to me was the most powerful message of thinking fast and slow. We know system two is, well, it works hard. All that cognitive thinking, that takes a lot of energy. But whenever we want to think about anything, that's what we use is system two. It also has a limit. I get a little disturbed when I pe people thinking that they're going to work for eight hours straight because the evidence now is you can only go 50 minutes. That's all you got. 50 minutes. And then system two says, wait, I need a break. I need to stand up, walk around, I need a piece of pizza, I need a cup of coffee. I just can't go longer than 50 minutes. And if you don't allow that, it will do it anyway. It's sort of like believing that you can go without sleep. After a while, your body, I heard Steve Wozniak say he worked for four days without sleep. I said, what kind of a recommendation is that? First of all, it's impossible. I don't believe it. I know what it's like to be that age. You tell a lot of good stories. <laughs> and he's a one wonderful storyteller. Now, I wouldn't want to take any of that away. But four days without sleep, that is not the best way to do anything. And we know that your brain will then hijack the rest of your activity, and you will go to sleep. That's why you should never drive when you haven't had enough sleep. Because your brain will say, I've got to have sleep, I've got to have sleep, and you will go to sleep. It will take over. It will insist. So will system two. It will insist. And it will take a break on its own. And you'll see as you try to focus for longer than 15 minutes, oh, oh gosh, I guess my mind wandered. I guess I wasn't totally paying attention for eight hours. I was sitting there. I was staring at that screen. But focused attention, I'm sorry. It's impossible. We know that this is how we learn. You focus on something. System two pays attention. And you practice it. You do a good job of walking or playing a sport or learning a new programming language. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. You practice it, and then system one will say, I can do this now. You don't have to worry about it. So if you play a sport, how many of you play golf or tennis or soccer or something? Yeah. If you play a sport and you're pretty good at it, do not consciously think about it. In fact, if you play one-on-one -on -one any kind of sport, say tennis, and you would like to have an edge on your opponent, all you have to do is force him or her to consciously think. Use system two for something where that person is now pretty good and is definitely using system one. Force them to use system two. And you do it like this. You go up to them in the, while you're having a break and say, wow, you really have an amazing serve. 
How do you do that? Do you put, is it your left foot? You've, you've got your left foot back and then, and then you kind of lean and, no, 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 no. It, it must be your right, no, your right foot, and then you, how do you do that? It's an amazing serve. I'm so impressed. And of course, your opponent doesn't know. They don't know how they serve. They've been doing it long enough, so now it's totally unconscious. But since you mentioned that, now when they serve, they're going to say, let's see, how do I do that? Is that my right? No. No, it's as I, do I lean back? They won't be able to do a thing. I'm just saying, you could remember that in future. It works for any sport, by the way. It doesn't have to be tennis. It doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. Just force them to consciously think. And of course, watch out. Don't let that happen to you. If you get into trouble playing golf, and now you want to overthink or slow down a process that you've been doing unconsciously, you'll get in your way. You won't be as good as you were. System two is too slow to do a good job of almost anything, except maybe some math problems. Yeah. Now, this is a model. All models are wrong, but some are useful. It's a great quote from George Box. Kahneman was never interested in saying, does this have anything to do with the prefrontal cortex, the newest part of the brain? Is that system too? No, he didn't care. He was not a research biologist. He was looking at behavior. So this is a behavioral model. It's how the brain works if you look at what it does, not what part of the brain does what part. And so I'm going to give you, just quickly, another model this is from the work of Jonathan Haidt. It was also used in a book by the two Heath brothers, Chip and Dan Heath. They said, your mind is like an elephant with a rider. So if we were going to do a little topological mapping here, we could say, well, the rider is a little bit like system two. The elephant is like system one. So who's in charge? Yeah, the elephant is in charge. The elephant will go where the elephant wants to go. And if you're going to have a discussion with somebody who doesn't agree with you, I always like to give the recommendation of talk to the elephant. Don't try to use logic. That's what the writer understands. The elephant understands things like food and nice, pleasant, green and happiness and other elephants. So make it easy for the elephant to do what you want to do. Don't try to argue the rider into agreeing with you. Talk to the elephant. Work on making the path better for the elephant instead of presenting a logical argument to the rider. We know system two not only can only run for 50 minutes, it takes a lot of energy. An enormous amount of energy. Some people say as much as a third of the calories that you intake are devoted to running your system two. So when we say pay attention, that's right. It costs you. It costs you to use system two. So if you think you're going to sit for eight hours and use the resources that it takes to run system two, that's really going to cost you and might not be the best way to solve the problem. We don't have a, a, an enormous amount of energy. It's limited. That's why we need to take breaks. That's why we need to feed it, actually. We know these two systems work together that normally system two says, okay, system one, whatever you want to do, okay with me. It doesn't override it. It kind of goes with the flow. And system one makes most of your decisions. So one of my favorite experiments has to do with chocolate cake. They asked two different groups of people to memorize a number. One of the numbers was only two digits long. The others was a seven-digit. 
And they said, we want you to walk down this really long hallway and tell the people at the other end what your number was, and then you can have your choice. You have a treat. You can have some nice, yummy chocolate cake, or you could have some nice, healthy fruit salad. Would it make a difference whether you memorized a seven-digit number or a two-digit number? whether you were going to choose the yummy chocolate cake or the healthy fruit salad? Would I be standing up here telling you this if it didn't make a difference? <laughs> yes, of course it makes a difference. Who uh, in the two groups, who of the two groups was more likely to pick the chocolate cake? Yeah, the seven-digit number and and who was more likely then to pick the nice healthy fruit salad? The two-digit. Why? Because willpower is another name for system two. And if you deplete it by asking it to do a lot of work, it doesn't have a much leftover energy to say, no, 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 I, I, I'm going to have the nice healthy fruit salad. Uh, yeah, no, no, well, no, well, I... Oh, yeah. give me that cake. That's system one talking, by the way. Give me the cake. It does make a difference. You have to be conservative with system two. This is a quote that always makes me cry. You'll see I only wear two colors. Obama had behavioral economists on staff. So I've got a lot of important decisions to make, much bigger than chocolate cake or fruit salad. I don't want to waste my cognitive energy on deciding things like, what should I wear? Or worrying about eating chocolate cake. Isn't that wonderful? A president who thinks. So first of all, here's the big message I got from thinking fast and slow is don't waste it. You have a limited amount of energy for system two. Don't waste it. Use it on the important things. So I found this interesting statistic that said, Office team survey of 2015 workers in North America said professionals spend an average of nine minutes choosing what they're going to wear. Well, I know it takes me zero minutes, so I think some people are spending 18 minutes on their decisions. So that's 18 minutes out of your 50-minute limit just deciding what you're going to wear that day. I would rather spend it on more important things. So I was a mathematician before I became a computer scientist. And I had an experience that I'll bet you have shared. I would work on a problem, probably like the one you were stuck on. And I would work, and I would work, and finally I would just give up. And I would say, I, I'll, just, I'll finish this tomorrow. I'm not getting anywhere. And I would just go to sleep. I would wake up in the morning and in the shower. Bingo. Have you ever had that experience? Yes. How does that work? Do angels come in the night and say, Linda, the answer is 42. <laughs> no, system one has been working all night. It can not only multitask, it never sleeps. Now, what I never understood until I read Thinking Fast and Slow, and I never experimented on our own because I didn't think about it, was how long do I have to work before I can say, hey, system one, I know you can multitask and you never sleep, so here, you work on this. And I then, my system two with its limited cognitive resources, I will go do something else. I never asked that question. So now I know the answer, at least for me. So you will have to experiment. I never work on anything longer than 10 minutes. 
10 minutes. And if I don't have the answer or the solution or an idea of how to proceed, I leave it. It's called incubation. Leave it. Hand it over to system one who is already working on it anyway. And then at some point later in that day or maybe the next day, I don't know, you can't plan it. Bingo! There will be the answer. And now I can go finish working on that problem. Now that I know how to proceed, I know what the answer is, I know what was holding me up, I know why I was stuck, I know what I hadn't thought of, because now I will remember something I read a long time ago that maybe I had forgotten, or an approach that I had used that I had really misremembered, or some idea or trick or technique or strategy that System 1 knew all about. It just needed to get through that door to say, hey, Linda, pay attention to me. It saves me an enormous amount of time. And in that space, after I hand it over, I should do something else. I can work on another problem. I can get up and walk around. I can do a little exercise. I can have lunch. I can do all kinds of other things, but stop working for eight hours straight, or even two hours straight, when system one can, in the background, solve it for you. Don't even spend a lot of time on research. Most of the time, you know more than you think. It's just that system two can't remember it. Whereas system one does remember. And it can help you out, if you will just allow it if you will just let it in. We know that System 1 can come up with all kinds of creative ideas. Since I read Thinking Fast and Slow, I began looking at how famous mathematicians, famous novelists, famous songwriters have all used this process to come up with creative, innovative ideas, not by consciously sitting and staring at a screen. None of them did that. No, they took a walk. Rachmaninoff spent hours in the forest. It was a, a plan. It was part of his day. He said, I know if I go for a walk when I come back, I will have lots of inspiration. All of those creative individuals knew something that I think we've forgotten. We have gotten so wedded to the screen that we've lost the ability to use our own brains. I already told you you can't multitask, so I'm going to skip that. System 2 is okay for certain things. It reads. System 1 does not. It does complicated math problems. System 1 does not. Although there is some new research that shows System 1 can do some pretty complicated math as well. We, we're still learning. What you're doing now, taking notes, listening to me, that's System 2. And, of course, we never do this. We never do nothing. As soon as you have a spare minute, out comes the phone. Psst. You must stare at it. You must stare at it for any time you have when you're not doing anything else. And we're losing the ability to do nothing. There is a part of your brain that's involved in creativity and innovation. It's called the right temporal parietal junction. It is also active when you do nothing. When you just let your mind go, daydream, mind wandering. If you don't do that, that part of your brain shrinks. And now, as a consequence, you are less creative, less innovative. And all you can do is take that horrible heads-down position Focused on your phone. I'm just saying. I'm not going to read that. I want to read that one. Since we just heard from Wozniak last night, that's what Steve Jobs said. If he wanted to work out an idea or talk to anybody about anything, 
he came into their office and he said, let's go for a walk. Let's talk about it. Let's just walk around and think about it. So I'm going to skip all these slides, but remember, you're going to ask me for the PowerPoint. I just want to tell, give you one last suggestion for better meetings. There should be a time limit. Of course, you can't pay attention. And I'm not going to say 50 minutes. I'm going to say 40 or 45. Because as soon as you reach the limit, somebody in the group is going to say, oh, wait, guys, don't forget to. And you're going to spend another five or 10 minutes anyway. So make that limit 40 minutes. And if you ever need to make a decision of any kind, always take a break before it. Have everyone get up, walk around, leave the room, and then come back. We know that the secret to solving problems is a bunch of small steps. So I'm hoping that maybe you'll start doing some experiments. Maybe 10 minutes is not the right time for you. I remember when they started talking about the Pomodoro technique. I thought, well, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. What is it? What is it for you? You should always be experimenting. But I hope that maybe when you leave this room, you will vow never to stare at a screen for eight hours. Here are some more sources of information, including my favorite podcast, which is You Are Not So Smart. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.